Good afternoon, folks, and absolutely delighted to have you on this fireside, Rajan. Welcome. Thanks, thanks, Atul. Good to be here. Yeah. So, folks, you know, Rajan needs no introduction, but I do want to say, you know, he's been one of the biggest and perhaps earliest supporters of our product and startup ecosystem, right? Not only has he helped shape the ecosystem, but he has literally, you know, put his money where the mouth is as one of the most prolific angel investors are now formally sort of wearing that hat at Sequoia. You know, with that, let's get into it. Uh, I'll tee up a couple of questions. And if the audience wants to put some questions in the chat window, we'll try and take those at the end as well. So Rajan, uh, you know, let's start, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say the Emerge 50 in 12 years, you know, is a good reflection of how our ecosystem has sort of evolved, right? In fact, arguably our ecosystem, as we know, is, you know, formally took off 10 to 15 years back, no more than that. So I think the awards have given us good aggregate insights uh, like Pari talked about and some of the speakers spoke about. So from your perspective, Rajan, what have you seen change just in the last couple of years? I think, uh, um, look, you know, a decade is a very long time. So if you look at 10 years, uh, Atul, as you know, we've seen uh, just a massive change on many dimensions. And then I think if you look at even the last three, four years, but over 10 years, you know, if you go back to 2010, we had only, you know, a few thousand startups, we had zero unicorns, and we had less than a billion dollars of venture capital funding per year coming into India. You look at end of 2019, right, we had over 40,000 startups, we had 32 unicorns or 29 unicorns. Um, and uh, last year we had $14.5 billion of venture capital funding. So, you know, it's come uh, really a very long way. And in many ways, the next five years, I think we'll, we'll easily, easily, easily more than double from here on total funding, we'll triple from here on unicorns and so on. But if you look at the last, I would say two to three years, uh, you know, we've seen changes along multiple dimensions that are even more profound. I'd say the first one is the broad basing of the ecosystem. Uh, so in many ways, even if, even if you go back five years ago, right, 2014, 15, it was really about a consumer internet story. And within consumer internet was really about e-commerce. And then a little bit of everything else, like a little bit of content, a little bit of everything else. Uh, but, but, you know, over the last three, four years, we've seen a massive broad basing, right? So if you look at consumer internet, it's, it's really gone way beyond sort of e-commerce, right? We have ed tech, we have digital health, uh, we have gaming, a whole bunch of other subsectors that have emerged. Uh, SaaS, uh, which you know you've been you know really a part of, and many of the Emerge 50 company have been a part of over the last decade, uh, has really come of age. Two years ago, we had zero SaaS unicorns. Today, we have five SaaS unicorns. I think we're now at a clip of creating two to three SaaS unicorns a year. So broad basing would be sort of one big one. Second is you know the 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 market, the domestic market, you know which uh, which really started getting very deep with the launch of Geo. Uh, now is not just deep on a user standpoint, right? We have 500 billion users. Uh, connected to the internet, uh, you know, consuming 16 gigabytes per user per month of data, which is unprecedented. Uh, but also the ability to monetize our markets is getting better. I would say if you ask me uh, what has really changed, one of the things, big changes has been the ability to monetize has gotten better, right? You look at a company like Unacademy. Unacademy is a unicorn, uh, you know, they got to $100 million of revenue about 15, 16 months after they started monetizing. And really, quite frankly, they built a unicorn on the back of about 250,000 paying users, right? And Gaurav, the founder, has been talking about some of these stats publicly, so I could share them. Um, so, so, so monetization, I think, uh, has been has been very important. Obviously, with SaaS companies, uh, the India to US uh, story has been, you know, established now for quite some time, like much like your company. Uh, but I think that the the, the ability to monetize the Indian ecosystem, I think, is uh, is so. That's number two. I think the third thing that has happened is I think the scaling of our digital public infrastructure started off with Adar. Uh, then, you know, UPI really created the most advanced digital ecosystem in the world. But now we are seeing, for instance, a national health stack, what NDHMA is going to do, uh, and so on and so forth. So I'd say that's 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 changed a lot. The last thing I'd say is quality of entrepreneurs, Atul, has just gone up dramatically, right? So every day I meet between five and seven founders. And I must say every day, I mean, I tell myself, wow, you know, <laughs> you know the quality just keeps improving year on year, right? And I think it's almost on this sort of, uh, it's not a linear curve, you know, every year the founders don't just get a little better. Uh, I think the, the quality of the founders is improving uh, by leaps and bounds. So, so I would say uh, in over 10 years, it's been a CC change of, of, you know, just a dramatic change across every dimensions. But I'd say even over the last three or four years, we've seen very meaningful change. Up Fantastic. No, that's a great summary, Rajan. And something I want to come back to, you mentioned monetization. I want to come back to Bharat. Rajan, as you know, there's a lot of new focus on Bharat, but as we know, we have a chicken and egg situation there around monetization, capital, etc. But let me 
uh, jump to the next uh, topic. You know, Rajan, I've heard you talk about the words world class a lot. And I know it sounds cliche, but I know you have a very deep meaning there, Rajan. So can you elaborate on what you mean there, especially for our founders who are tuned in? Yeah, I think, uh, look, uh, you know, world class means just that, right? It's world class. It's been best in, you know, best in the world, right? At what you do. So, you know, how do you think about that, right? So if you think about products, right? Are you building world class products? So, you know, we've had this big question over the last four or five months in India after TikTok got banned, right? Um, you know, uh, can we build TikTok scale products? Uh, you know, we've got a bunch of products that have gotten to 30, 40, 50, 60 million uh, users, short video apps. But, you know, if you look at retention rates of most of those apps, they're still very, very poor, right? I mean, TikTok's monthly retention is world-class, right? So you can say, okay, if you've launched a short video app in India, what's your monthly retention? What's your D30 retention? What's your D60 retention, right? I mean, you can, you know, there's one or two metrics you can look look at and sort of say, you know, is this product getting close to world-class? Ideally, world-class should be. So one is just building world-class products, right? So if you're building a SaaS product, it's not whether you can go and get 1 million of revenue or 2 million of revenue or 10 million of revenue. I think that's important, but that's not really the question, right? The question really is, uh, you know, are you building world-class products that can compete at global stages, right? So on, on the global stage. So, 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 so that's, that's sort of on the product dimension. I think the rest of it is on talent, right? I think as, as startups, um, you can, I, you know, I have this saying, uh, Atul, that uh, you can hire the people you know best. That's what most founders do or you can hire the best talent. And there is a world of a difference between those two things. Now you could be fortunate where you happen to know the best talent uh, you know, in the world for what you're doing, right? But most often than not, that's not the case. Um, and, and so, you know, talent is another one, right? Like, you know, do you, are you really hiring the absolute best talent in the world? You look at culture, right? A lot of startups actually don't have a great culture. For those of you that are founders on this call, you know, if you've got more than 20 or 30 employees, reach out to the X to 10X team. This is uh, Psyche, uh, you know, Bini Bunsen and others, they have X to 10X, you know, take the e-employee, they, they have this survey called, e, you know, employee NPS, Atul, right? It's, it's, you know, these guys have built a whole set of SaaS products for, uh, for, for early stage and growth stage startups, right? The average e-NPS in Indian startups is 20. That means 80% of the employees who work in Indian startups would not recommend them. 30% of their sample size, 30% of well-funded Indian startups have negative NPS. So do you think these companies have a world-class culture? Absolutely not. They have the world's worst culture, right? So, so, so it's along all these dimensions, right? It's every aspect of what you do. You know, you should be thinking about, is this world-class, right? And, and it's about quality. It's about hiring quality talent. It's about building quality products. It's about having an amazing culture, right? Uh, it's about really being very, very capital efficient, for instance, right? I think most SaaS companies are reasonably, you know, capital efficient, but like, you know, you know, founders come and tell me, look, they raised five, $600 million and they're worth 1.2 billion. I mean, do you really think that's a world-class company? The answer is absolutely not. Absolutely not, right? You cannot be a world-class company if you raised half a Half a, half a billion dollars and you're worth $1.2 billion. Because keep in mind, Google raised $25 million is worth a trillion dollars. Right now, of course, 20 years later, right? But that's all they raised. I mean, lifetime, lifetime, right? So so, so I think I think it's it's that that concept of, uh, you know, I think Jugaad is like a really bad thing for startups, right? Because Jugaad is the, is the, is the antithesis of world class, right? You're not deeply thinking about building amazing products. And by the way, I'm not saying you know, you should launch and iterate, right? But your goal should be to get to um, sort of an absolute, you know, build incredible products, right? You build products that just wow customers. So that, the, the, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of different things. But, you know, if you sum it all up, what is it? You, are you truly building world-class products with world-class teams and creating a culture that is truly the best in the world? Yeah. I, I love that part where you said you should be able to stand up to global competition, whether that's India or internationally. And, you know, one of the questions we always ask ourselves, Rajan, is who's the Facebook of India? Well, it's Facebook. Who's the LinkedIn of India? LinkedIn. Who's the Google of India? Google. Amazon of India. We could argue there. The jury's still out there. But you're absolutely right. Uh, Rajan, you know, you tend to talk a lot about the emphasis on product market fit, which is kind of related to, you know, being world class or being on their journey, right? Uh, and that's a big, bigger issue, I would say, in our ecosystem, as we know, versus the valley. I think we have a lower hit rate 
and our startup really struggled to figure out how to get to PMF. How do our startups, you know, start to unravel that better and faster? Any thoughts? Yeah, I think, uh, um, by the way, it's not clear to me whether more startups in the US get to product market fit than India. But I would say where it starts off by saying is most startups in the US understand that they need to get to product market fit. Otherwise, they don't have a company. <laughs> you know, like if you don't get to product market fit, you don't have a company, right? I mean, it's the first step if you're a seed stage company. The only thing that matters is you have to get to product market fit, right? So I think what we need to do as an ecosystem, one is build a lot more awareness about how do you know how do you define product market fit, right? And by the way, the definition, you know, it, it varies by, you know, you know the, 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 the thing that you'll get when you talk to most people is you'll know it when you see it. Yes, of course, that happens, right? So you talk to Bini, I was talking to Bini the other day and like, when did they know product market fit? I mean, they just started listing some books and it started flying off the shelf. Yes, now you have product market fit. That was 2009 Indian e-commerce, right? But that doesn't happen all the time, right? A lot of the times you have to engineer your way to product market fit. But so if you're, a, let's say you're building a, a gaming app, right? How do you know what product market is? Well, you have to define, a, you know, it's a certain set of use, you know, app metrics that you could define it, right? If you're an SMB SaaS company, how do you know you have product market fit? It's, you know, actually got to do with churn, right? If you have 5% monthly churn and you say, you know, India to the US uh, SMB SaaS company, you do not have product market fit, right? If you're an enterprise SaaS company, how do you know you have product market fit? You know, you have X number of paying customers. You have a certain ACV that you can get to if that's what you're trying to get to. And you have, you know, net revenue retention of, I don't know, let's call it one ten percent So so depending on the kind of business that you're building, I think, you know, we need to build awareness so that founders sort of know what they should be gunning for, right? Because a lot of companies, especially, you know, in the SaaS world, right, people just focus on getting to revenue, right? 10K a month, 50K a month, 100K a month. You know, I, I, you know, it's very interesting, not in the search portfolio, but, you know, in my angel portfolio, you know, I have a few companies, right? I mean, they're scaling revenue. They're SaaS companies, they're scaling revenue, but their churn is, is not world-class. It's anywhere close to world-class and they don't have product market fit. So every time they send me a monthly update saying, yay, you know, we hit like a hundred and, you know, X hundred thousand dollars worth of MRR, right? Growing very fast. I mean, my response right back is you missed the most important number on this update, which is what is churn, right? Because if your churn, monthly churn is five, six percent as an SMB SaaS company, especially if you're India, US SMB SaaS, right? you don't have product market fit, right? It's different if you're a prosumer SaaS, maybe that number is okay, et cetera. So I think one is building awareness. I think the second one, Atul, is just obsessive focus on customers, right? You know, you know, the only way you get there is, is you just got to be obsessively focused on what the users want, right? And I don't think, I think as Indian founders, and maybe because we haven't had, you know, you know, a lot of companies where you can get trained as product managers, right? If you ask me, you know, you know, like we need to 10x or actually we need to more like 100x the number of world class product managers that we have in the ecosystem, right? And I wish that, you know, some of our leading unicorn companies sort of create much more structured, you know, uh, uh, product management programs like Google, Facebook, others, right? They have these product management programs. You go in your two, three years, that's all you're doing. You're learning about product management. So I think obsessing about customers, you know, third thing would be the product management science, right? I do think it's very, very important. Let's say you're two engineers building a company or let's say you're an engineer and a, and a, and a salesperson building a company. Take the time before you launch the company or, you know, maybe in the early days of launching your company to really learn the science of product management, right? Product management is a science. It's like anything else, right? You can't like, you know, like, you know, I, I was a sales leader, right? I can't wake up one day, um, you know, and then say, look, I'm going to go be a CTO. That's just not going to happen, right? Because I just can't, that, you know, that, that's, that's, that's a profession by itself. So, so similarly, I think that's the third thing I would say is, is taking the time to really learn the science of product management. So I'd say all of, all of those kinds of things, but it starts off by asking this question. I don't know how many, how many founders are on this call, but you know, at least the winners, right? I'm assuming all the winners have product market fit. That's why they're winners. But, uh, but I think this is something that we should do much more of in the ecosystem, Atul, which is build awareness of how do you define product market fit depending on the type of business that you're in. Fantastic. No, great summary. And, you know, Rajan, you talked about product management. Look, we all recognize it's the crown jewel. It's not a role. It's a culture. It's a way of thinking. And at NASCOM, Rajan, you'll be happy to know there's a big focus on product skilling, starting with product management. We have a goal to create 50,000 product managers in India in the next five years. So, you know, we're working on it. Fantastic. So, Rajan, you know, switching to deep tech, as you know, we've been doing a lot of work on deep tech at NASCOM through the Deep Tech Club and so on. Uh, you know, we've so far 
you know, looked at an ecosystem of about a thousand companies. We are mentoring nearly a hundred. Uh, you know, one of the big issues, the obvious issue that comes out is, you know, how do you go about patient capital to build deep R&D? And that's really in short chain. So how do we solve that as an ecosystem or can we? No, I mean, look, I think, I think firstly, we have, we have an R&D problem, right, in the country. So uh, R&D starts not with sort of uh, risk capital, but R&D starts with, you know, basically with government spending in universities, government spending in research, large companies spending on research, right? So in none of the Indian companies here, the tech companies are not at a scale where they can spend a lot of money on research and the big, you know, the big groups really haven't started doing that yet, right? So so I think, uh, you know, as a result, look, I think the deep tip companies that we we will build, and by the way, you know, even as Sequoia, right, we made a number of, you know, made quite a number of investments actually in deep tech. Uh, recently, sort of companies like Avatar.me, Bobot, which I think is a NASCOM, uh, NAS, you know, which is a, I think, Emerge 50 company, right? I think Bobot was one of, or one of those two was a Emerge 50 company. So we've made a whole bunch of, you know, we've twin health in healthcare and so on and so forth. But I would say, you know, the kind of companies that I think Indian entrepreneurs, deep tech companies will build and scale over the next five years, Atul, my view, are going to be applying existing technologies to big problems, right? Either large Indian problems or large global problems. And they'll be very, very focused on solving specific set of, uh, you know, customer problems, right? I do think if you're building a startup that's going to require five years worth of R&D before you can launch a product, um, that is going to be very difficult to get financed through private capital in India. So, so, so either you've got to say, look, this kind of thing is much better financed in the U.S. Move to the U.S. Or you know, you say, look, I've got to get grants or foundation money or you know, government money or whatever it is, because it's going to be very, very difficult. And I think it's just a matter of time. Like, so it's the same thing, right? You look at hardware. Uh, you, you know, we haven't had any hardware companies come out of India yet. We have a few that are very interesting, like Ather and so on, but. Uh, but but we don't have an ecosystem of hardware investors, right? So 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 same thing with deep tech. I mean, if it's going to require three four years of R and D, uh, etc., I think it will be very very difficult. Now to do that, um, you know, look at the end of the day, right? It's a sort of a catch twenty two. Investors in invest in things that scale uh, and become large companies, and will create large exits, right? And so uh, and and the harder it is to do that, you know, and the longer the lo longer it's going to take, you know, it gets into a bit of a cycle, right? So I actually think that. You know, much like we've done with SaaS, I think with deep tech too, right? Applying, uh, you know, computer vision to, you know, there are there are a thousand problems that you can apply computer vision to, but you if you apply it well, your training, your models are going to be so much better than anybody else. You're very focused. You go deep. You think global, and I think you can build larger companies. The same thing, you know, whether it's speech to text, whether it's you know IoT, whether it's you know edge computing, is find sort of a user problem that you can define. So I'm not answering your question. I, I guess what I'm saying is it's not going to happen anytime soon, <laughs> you know. Uh, but 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 if you are building a deep tech company, you know, get much more focused uh, on a specific set of user problems. Uh, and really think about GTM. That's the other thing that our deep tech companies really lack is they're not as good at GTM, right? I mean, you can't build a $100 million revenue company without having a kick-ass GTM. So you've got to start building your GTM early, start thinking about that and things like that. Well said, well said. Rajan, if you take a step back, you know, if you look at the big picture, we had less than 1% of global market share of product, which is estimated to be between half a trillion moving to a trillion, and which is about a third, fourth of overall IT spend, right? So product is really getting big very fast. I mean, SaaS is a great example there. Um, where, when do you think India emerges with some sizable market share? And you really said it, I mean, there's a process to this, right? It won't happen overnight, but when do you think we'll be a dominant player in the product space, if you will? So I don't know what dominance means, right? So, so I don't know what that means um, because at the end of the day, right, you know, if you really want large dominance, you need to have a large you know, domestic market, right? I mean, the US has a, you know, whatever, right? Five, you know, of the $500 billion of enterprise software, I think 200 billion of that is spent, 200, almost 300 billion of enterprise software spends in the US. So if you're in the US, you know, you can scale companies much faster, right? Because you can just, you know, fly to New York or, you, you know, it's just easier to do, right? Uh, but I do think our ecosystem is scaling quite well, Atul, right? So as I said, two years ago, we had zero SaaS unicorns. Now we have five. We had a clip of creating two or three SaaS unicorns. I think by 2025, we'll easily have, 25 SaaS unicorns, right? Uh, and then it's going to go. I mean, I'll give you a very interesting uh, example of why this is happening now, or why I feel so confident. You know, we start our next cohort of Surge, which is the Sequoia early stage program, where I spend most of my time now, right? It starts like end of next week. I can't tell you the exact numbers, but a very significant percentage of our companies in our next Surge cohort are actually SaaS companies, right? And some of them are actually 
uh, deep tech, dev tools, those kinds of those kinds of companies. So, uh, so I think it's beginning to happen. So I, I do I do I actually think this is the year, you know 20, 2020 to twenty thirty is India's decade for SaaS. Uh, so I think we're going to see some super super interesting companies that are going to get built out, and not just the unicorns, right? I think we're going to. I mean, in many ways, India's SaaS story is going to be about thousands of SaaS companies, right? And because the reality is, look, if you're, let's say, two engineers coming out of Infosys or Wipro or wherever, or, or Google or Cisco, right? You build a company that's $5 million of revenue, you employ 15 people, uh, and then you have $2.5 million of net profit, uh, you know, you're taking a million and a half each home, right? That's pretty good living, right, Atul? So, so, so I think if you can have a thousand companies like that, you know, then it gets to be very interesting. So, so, so I do think it has started. The trains definitely left the station now, Atul, and I think we are accelerating now. Fantastic. That's great. Rajan, I mean, as we know, you know, it's very hard to build a hundred million dollar company, enterprise company in India based on the domestic market, which will take its own, you know, curve, right? But uh, if you were to give one tip for founders looking to start in the US, right, the biggest market, what would that be? See, I think if you're, well, ideally would move to move to the US, you know, <laughs> you know, look at the end of the day, if you're going to build a US company, move to the US, you know, like, you know what I'm saying? But, but, but the more nuanced answer to that would be, Atul, if you're building an SMB SaaS company, right? Like Girish at Freshworks, mm. they were able to get to north of $100 million of revenue before Girish moved to uh, the Bay Area, right? Because it was a SMB sales motion, right? It's inside sales, content-driven, demand-gen-led sort of sales motion, right? Um, uh, now, by the way, with, with COVID, I think even enterprise sales... Are you guys there? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. My connection keeps dropping. I think with COVID, even enterprise sales will become a little easier without sort of being in market, right? But if you're building an enterprise SaaS company, uh, I do think you need to be there, right? Because one of the interesting insights I've had, Atul, is, you know, a lot of companies think they can get to four, five, ten million dollars of revenue in India and then expand to the US. Uh, I actually think that's quite difficult to do. Okay. Fantastic. Look, we're out of time, but let me take one question, Rajan. I mean, you talked about consumer stuff is very easy to build. Uh, you know, uh, Sridhar talked about the layers of deep tech uh, as he was speaking earlier uh, under the hood, right? How do entrepreneurs figure out the gaps in terms of deep tech that can be commercialized? You know, like building operating systems. Talk to customers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, look. I think if, if it's if it's a if it's a if it's a technology that you're going to sell to somebody, right? So meaning, if you're not in the infrastructure layer, right, then you should talk to customers. I think the number one thing that you know the Indian deep tech custom founders should do is talk to more customers. Got it. Okay, Rajan, are you still there? I think uh, we may be losing Rajan. So. You know, with that, uh, let's end here. I think we're over time. That was great fun. Thank you, Rajan. And, uh, you know, what we'll try and do is we'll do a Twitter storm uh, with Rajan in the next couple of weeks, and we'll uh, make sure we take up all the pending questions. Thank you very much again, Rajan. Thank you.